Listen, if you ask me one more question like that, I'll rip your eyes out and send them out over the airways right now. Do you understand? I can understand. Hi, and uh, welcome to uh, Thinking Out Loud. My name is Sheldon McLeod on the Saltwire Network. And I, I remember in high school uh, watching uh, the CBC Late News, or the Supper News, and uh, seeing this man by the name of Jim Nunn as a uh, anchor, speaking to us, telling us the stories. But there was this interaction he had with a couple of other journalists that really captivated me. And I, I believe to this day, that's part of the reason why I've been doing what I've been doing. Uh, Harry... Fleming, Harry the Hat, and Parker Dunham, and Jim Nunn. What a team. Uh, and the passing of Jim Nunn, just uh, as I arrived back in Nova Scotia, I saw that uh, he had passed away this Sunday night at the age of 72, died in hospital, and Parker Dunham joins me now. And Parker, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for helping me remember Jim Nunn today. Well, I'm pleased to do it. He was an extraordinary person, and, um, you know, time passes. It's uh, uh 20 plus years since the political panel with me and Harry and Jim was on television. So a lot of people don't really remember it very well. What did you recall or what can you tell us about that first time that you met Jim Nunn? I probably met him at a political convention or something like that, or I may have been brought into the Halifax studio to do some kind. I don't specifically remember, but um, I mean, I was a journalist, he was a journalist, so it was probably at some news event. And um, he was a striking figure. He was tall, I don't know, six three maybe, and um, handsome, and um, um, <laughs> very assertive. Uh, and made his presence known. Um, he had a cheekiness in his interviews um, that you don't see much of today. You see some people who, you see a lot of people, uh, present company accepted, of course, who do a lot of preening on air, a lot of virtue signaling on air, a lot of playing to the peanut gallery. But Jim just liked to poke and prod and he always punched up. He liked to punch, but he always punched up. He liked to, um, uh, he liked nothing better than to interview a stuffed shirt uh, and poke the stuffing a bit. I love the fact that when he'd get an answer that he thought might have been trying to get something over on us, he'd, he'd give a little giggle or a little laugh. It, a little, you could tell just by his demeanor that I'm not buying this and neither are the people on the other side of this lens. You know, pe um, people in public life today are trained and trained and trained and trained ad nauseum to um, speak in talking points. They rehearse lines. They rehearse lines they can use to get to the line they want to say from the question they don't want to answer. And the public's cottoned on to this. They, they understand when people are bloviating and, and talking around an issue. And Jim was superb at puncturing that, and people admired him for it. It was fun to watch. And in reading uh, the CBC article saying that there were politicians who just did not want to be interviewed by him. I'm sure you heard about that or, or know of you know people who would just not want to set themselves up for that kind of uh, an interview. I remember one particular episode. You know, Billy Joe was one of the most colorful MLAs in our province's history, got in trouble with the law for um, abusing his expense accounts um, and um, uh, was convicted of that, actually, uh, ran again as an independent and won. And on that particular election night, there was a, rem a remote with all the satellite dishes you mentioned set up at Billy Joe's office. So at some point during the evening, we went to Port Hawkesbury and Jim interviewed Billy Joe. <laughs> there was a guy standing behind Billy Joe who was part of his entourage, who was roughly the size of two refrigerators, just a big giant of a man. And Jim is peppering Billy Joe with tough questions. And from behind the Billy Joe, this big fellow says, 
Like to hear see you come to Port Hawkesbury and ask that question, Jim. <laughs> and we did, in fact, go to Port Hawkesbury because the political panel used to go on the road. And a few months later, we had a um, session in Port Hawkesbury and was right in the front row. And Jim was a little nervous, <laughs> but it but it, it it went off just fine. 72 years young. I'll use that as I get older. That uh, age is a very young age. Uh, you had st- struck up a friendship that lasted beyond the broadcast world and into personal lives. When was the last time you spoke with him? Uh, I saw him twice while he was in the hospice unit at St. Martha's Hospital. We remained very close. We even took a couple of road trips together in retirement. Uh, one year we flew to uh, <laughs> we flew to Atlanta and rented a big Mercury Grand Marquis, big black car, and drove around the American South, uh, taking the old parkways that the interstate had replaced. And those roads typically went through the center of town. So when when it got to be lunchtime, we'd find the next town and look for a restaurant that was locally owned and had a lot of cars in the parking lot. We'd always end up chatting up the owner and uh, Jim would strike up a conversation with anyone. We had a great time. He was a dear friend. I'm going to miss him a lot. It's a real, a real kick in the gut to have him go so young. And, and you mentioned how the style of journalism that he did, that type of, uh, inquisitorial mind. He, he he must have done, I won't say a lot of research, but he must have been very plugged into a lot of the world around him that you could tell he was a learned man. Father was an MLA and a cabinet minister. Um, and so he grew up steeped in Nova Scotia politics, specifically liberal party politics. Um, but in general, you know, as a, t- as a young boy, he would have, he told me about sitting at the top of the steps at late at night when his parents thought he was in bed, listening in to conversations between his father and other liberal party honchos who were plotting strategy for the next election or whatever. Uh, So he was really knowledgeable. Everybody knew him. He had done stints in Ottawa as a young reporter. And um, of course he was, host of Marketplace in Toronto for a time. So he was well known nationally and he had access. He could call people and get them on the phone, except the people who didn't want to talk to him. Um, but even it's not enough to say that he was did probing interviews or did um, uh, um, searching interviews. He always had a little twinkle in his eye, a little spark, a little, there was always a little humor. He, he didn't take the world overly seriously i love that story about it was a live broadcast and they were supposed to take calls and he said my mother warned me there'd be days like this Uh, (laughs) prior to the youtube world and 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 online i don't think that kind of candor or honesty was was available to us on a local television channel you got over the airwaves it it it, it did make an imprint you you and and harry and and jim nunn made a big imprint imprint on a lot of folks and i'm I'm sorry to say there's nothing quite like that out there in this bombastic world where you could agree to disagree and do so in a very entertaining way. That was that was Jim's invention. He invented that panel, recruited me, did Harry. He just instinctively knew. I don't know if he knew how well it would work. I certainly didn't. I thought it would go for a few episodes and die, but it went for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. And... It was the most popular 15 minutes on the CBC network, 24 hours a day. Like nowhere in their schedule did they get more viewers than they did on Thursday nights when Harry and Parker came on. Um, and at first I was I found it kind of weird because I like to do deep, um, well-researched, sometimes too long pieces about issues. And here we were just throwing off one-liners off the top of our heads. And at first I found it kind of embarrassing, but it really did connect with people in an exceptional way. And, and um, I mean, people would uh, talk to me all the time about how they never missed it. Nowadays, people tell me, oh, my grandfather never missed that show. (laughs) 
It was like listening to three friends at a bar somewhere. And I'm sure that happened exactly. on occasion. I'm exactly. sure that happened from time yeah. to time where it was three gentlemen at a bar somewhere. And I'm sure the stories, there are stories that you're, you're not willing to tell or shall go with you till ever and, and to the end. So uh, I guess the final thoughts on, on, on Jim Nunn and his, his legacy for, for media, for journalism, and on the fact that he stayed here in Nova Scotia. If you go to the ATV website or the CTV Atlantic website, um, they have a nice piece on Jim and there are several clips of him and they really nicely capture that spark in his eye and that quality he had that uh, it, it wasn't just snarky and it wasn't just virtue signaling. It was um, taking taking some, bringing some, a sense of humor to his work, a, a kind of joyfulness to his work. Uh, Parker Dunham, thank you for doing this. I know you have a busy day. Glad to have your thoughts, your, your memories about uh, the late Jim Nunn. And, and thank you so much for that. My pleasure, Sheldon. I, Really appreciate your uh, reaching out to me.